I'm super stoked for this episode to be released because I think this episode may move the needle. If, if the right people hear this, the right students hear this, this episode alone, if they really pay attention, we're going to look back on this in a decade and we're going to say, holy shit, that was it. That was that point that tipped. It created the momentum to move things into a direction that we never thought that they could move. Welcome back to the Atlas of Chiropractic podcast joined uh, by Dr. Cameron Bearder and Dr. Brian Hutchison. There's just a whole new world we've opened up to understanding some of these subtle upper cervical conditions. Because you're practicing orthospinology and using DMX, correct? So how are you assessing um, how you want to go about adjusting the upper cervical spine? I take everything that I've learned in those classes in my assessment of if C1 is in the right position mm -hmm. is I find often that when we get really good curvature and also some form of spinal stability, even if it's just through, you know, the musculature and tendinous component, that the bones go out of alignment so much less. I mean, they almost mm. just fall right into place. And then mm. managing these uh, individuals becomes a lot easier. But I do, I do do leg length analysis. I do paraspinal tenderness check. Um, I do take all my imaging into account. And then uh, I will kind of neurologically test if I'm going to adjust it in this vector, does it clear it out before I'll adjust it? So I get a lot of that input without taking all the orthogonal films. Yeah. Uh, I think that eventually we'll find through people like us that are doing a lot of research, you know, how to discern whether something's seen on a CBCT or on a digital motion x-ray has more validity, or we'll almost be able to develop a model of um, you know, an open mouth uh, view with a DMX or a plane film, you may see C2 spinous is rotated right. But then if you got a 3D cone beam CT, you may find a very small percent or more of those have a congenital malformation of the C2 spinous so that it's actually always going to be rotated right. Not many people have used a cone beam and DMX. If it, is there anything that sticks out in your head in terms of combining the two? What was your experience using both of those? Did you guys, con did you consistently do both on patients or was it kind of trial and error or case dependent? The entry point for these hard cases, which they were already screened like really carefully, right? The yep. team would screen people and turn away a lot of people if they didn't fit really, if we didn't think that we could help them. But yeah they would get a cone beam CT scan done and also a digital motion x-ray. And in the first year of using them both, the main things that I saw that would discern or change care, um, first of all, that the way we used it was the Atlantostyloid interval is super crisp and clear mm -hmm. on um, cone beam. And yeah. so on DMX, you can only tell if it's going to approximate the atlas, but you can't tell the precise you know, millimeter of distance and uh, what is your take on that in terms of the whole styloid approximation type thing most of the time that people that have styloids that appear to be long that they don't need to get them removed but wow at the same time it's more i think significant is how close that it is to the atlas and then yep. where it is along the you know along the atlas because if it's really way out to the side yeah. You may have a little more freedom in the carotid sheath, but also if it's way out to the side, it could be just so close that it's causing a bit of irritation on rectus capitis lateralis or on, you know, it could be irritating like a muscle that connects from C1 to the skull. And then when it's way out there, you know, it could also be just co contributing to neurologic type symptoms or yeah. like not holding your adjustment. So there's a lot of things to consider with that. But I would say that I, I was on a Zoom call with uh, Dr. Gillette out of Barcelona. He's a neurosurgeon there. And oh, yeah. he said that you need at least uh, three millimeters or more between the atlas and styloid. Wow. So if you ever have one and, you know, it's like three or two and um, it's just, you know, you're not able to distance it because sometimes if they're really poor curve and they're out of alignment, you know, we've been able to improve that curvature and then get a gentle lordosis. And now you know, by moving the app, pulling the atlas back through whatever we do for treatment and getting the head to hold back on top instead of falling in certain positions where that usually when I see the head fall backward and the atlas fall forward, it shrinks the space between most people think this is going to open it because you're in extension. But yeah. then I've seen the atlas translates a little bit further and the skull kind of, you know, on the condyles kind of falls back. So that's going to push the atlas and the styloid just a millimeter closer sometimes. So mm -hmm. we, we first try to see, can we create more than three 
or four millimeters of space at the bare minimum. And we try to do that as quick as possible because these people are suffering. And if they yeah. have carotid sheath compression or, you know, neurologic symptoms, the longer they're in that like fight or flight, like vagus yeah. nerve is going nuts and everything's getting hit, you know, the harder it's going to be to neurologically heal. But speaking of ultrasound, like we've kind of sniffed it around a little bit. I don't want to, I want to have plenty of time to talk about that. Um, you know, let's, let's get into your use of ultrasound in practice, maybe how you got started with it, some of your findings, the procedures you do to, to use that technology. You know, so first of all, so I measure the carotid sheath from right at the clavicle all the way up to C1. And then also the vertebral arteries, you know, below C1, above C1. So, you know, V3, V4, right? Getting peak systolic velocity. I'm also getting uh, color to see like what the flow looks like, like how much blood is going through and, you know, diameter of these vessels or, or the, the entire uh, circumference of them. With the measurements of the vessels, it's pretty neat because Dr. John, you know, mentioned that, you know, there are variances that are normal. And so what I look for are things that stand out like a sore thumb. And so, yeah. you know, if one side's a little bit larger than the other, fine, as long as there's a good color, like there's good flow through both sides. If one side, there's like no flow through it, even if it's open, then that's something I'm starting to put a little bit of weight on. Like, wait, there's only blood really leaving. I mean, the carotid, you can see it pulsing, but the jugular, there's like nothing leaving it here at all. Like this is not, you know, this probably isn't normal. And then often what we see is right where, this is where I think it ties together is right where on imaging that they have like, a, you know, C5 might, you might see like a little bit more forward and then it comes straight from like C4 up to C1. It's like they all their little yeah. doses at C5. And then right at C5 on ultrasound is where the vessel gets jammed closed and there's no blood going through. So now yeah. you're starting to get more of a scientific, you know, understanding that that is not right. That's abnormal. And then once we start to figure out how we can pull that C5 back up here and get it to stay here, blood flows, it's open. So now your sympathetic chain's not getting irritated, vagus nerve's not getting irritated. You know, that's what we care more about is like, of course we like blood flow with chiropractors, you know, we want the nervous system to function because, you know, if those nerves are getting irritated, they're gonna mess up the blood flow also. I mean, well, that's, yeah. we didn't even talk about the weights, but that's another interesting concept. I started getting introduced to spinal weighting by Dr. Dennis Wogan. The weights are incredible because, mm -hmm. you know, I'll have somebody in, in these kind of aha cases where, you know, all healing, I think is, is miraculous, but sometimes when it happens so quick, you, you know, it kind of makes you kind of your eyes really open. You're like, Whoa, really? You know, in just a couple of days. And when we've put people in weights, I mean, we've had people that couldn't feel, uh, you know, emotions for 20 years, like start to feel like emotions. Cause like, you know, the, it's a combination of the cerebral spinal fluid flow improving, mm -hmm. um, better, you know, venous drainage, less force to get arterial blood into the head. And, um, just all of those things together collectively, all of a sudden, like there's not pressure on those areas in the brain and they can actually start to, you know, turn back on. So just as we're kind of, as, as we're concluding here, doc, is there any last words of encouragement or advice you'd like to leave with the listeners? For the chiropractors and students that are listening to your podcast, there are probably ones that, you know, still believe that chiropractors have an incredible ability to help a whole host of health conditions beyond just mechanical back pain. And, you know, this is one of the avenues, what Dr. Uh, Stenberg and what Dr. Bearder are doing here is really trying to empower you to, you know, realize the potential to, to kind of discover that there are so many different neurologic based conditions that can come from structural problems that we can treat. So, um, you know, definitely let's keep pushing forward the standard of our, of our science and what we do so we can continue to not only gain respect, but to really validate you know, and, and quickly get people in a standardized way better consistently. Because I know I've heard Dr. Bearder say that, you know, well, once in a blue moon, you got rid of this thing, but how do you reproduce that again and again and again? So, you know, this is one of the paths is listening. So I commend you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Stenberg, for welcoming me to your show and also Dr. Bearder. And I hope we can do it again soon.